Unfinished business where ghosts help solve their own murders make for great book and movie plots, don't they? The first movie that comes to mind with such a storyline is one you may have heard of. It's from 1990, the appropriately named Ghost, starring Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, and Whoopi Goldberg. Wasn't like it was a hit or anything. As far as books, there have been plenty that use this idea too. I'm going to reference one that I'm intimately familiar with, as well as do a little shameless self-promotion for my second novel, The Ghost of Lori Floyd. Everyone thinks Lori committed suicide, but her ghost finds someone who finally listens to the truth. But in real life, have any ghosts ever helped solve their own murders? Yes, maybe not as dramatically as portrayed in fiction. Or have they? I'll let you be the judge of that as we explore a few such cases in this episode of Haunting American True Crimes. Thank you for joining me. My name is Courtney Maroc. I'll be your host and guide for this episode. We'll begin our audio voyage with the haunting case of Zona Heaster Shue, who is also known as the Greenbrier Ghost. Was Elva Zona Heaster Shue murdered on January 22, 1897, or on January 23, 1897? It depends on which reference source you consult. Both the Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits and RoadsideAmerica.com say her body was found on January 23rd. But I found an article from the Independent Herald dated February 18, 1904 that reported her husband, Erasmus Trout Shoe, murdered her on January 22nd. That's something all sources agree on, that she was murdered. Another is that her ghost helped solve her murder, which is how she earned the moniker the Greenbrier Ghost. Let's take a look at the victim and get to know who Zona was a little bit better. There isn't a lot of information about the early life of Elva Zona Heaster, who went by Zona. What is known about her is that she was born in Greenbrier County sometime around 1873, and in 1895, she gave birth to a child out of wedlock. Then, in 1896, she married Erasmus Stribling Trout Shoe, 33, the man who would become her husband and her murderer. Trout Shoe, as he was known, but is also sometimes referred to as Edward Shoe, was a drifter who found work as a blacksmith. He married Zona shortly after meeting her. Here's where accounts once again differ slightly, though. The Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits lists their marriage date as October 26, 1896. Wikipedia also says the two married in October 1896. However, the Independent Herald article cites Judge Joseph McWhorter as saying the couple married in November 1896, but he also called Zona Ziona. Either way, their honeymoon didn't last long. A little more than a couple of months after tying the knot, Trout killed Zona. I don't know about you, but I think that's probably the worst anniversary present any husband could give a wife. Now let's dive a little bit more into the murder itself. On the day of her murder, Shu stopped by a black family's house that lived nearby and asked the son, 12-year-old Anderson Andy Jones, to do some chores at the house that day and to take some eggs to the store for Zona. Zona. 
At noon, he stopped back by and asked if Andy had been to the house yet, which he hadn't. And I'm thinking Shu probably knew that because all hell hadn't broken loose yet. Did the Jones family find it strange that Shu had stopped back by at lunchtime because he had said he wasn't going home for lunch that day? I didn't find anything about that, but in hindsight, I wonder if the Jones family found that strange. Anyway, when poor Andy did finally go to the house, he found Zona and ran home to tell his mom. A doctor was sent for, and he determined Mrs. Shu had died of heart failure. Both pedias, both the Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits, and Wikipedia, that is, say that Dr. Knapp first listed her cause of death as everlasting faint, but later changed it to childbirth, even though it's not clear that she was pregnant. She could have been, but it would have been the first trimester, because keep in mind their whirlwind romance and hasty but short marriage. Adding to Shu's strange behavior, and something detectives these days would surely find suspicious, was that the husband had changed his wife's clothing before the doctor arrived into a dress with a high neck and stiff collar secured by a bow, according to the Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits. He was also very attentive to her head, when the doctor came, Shu cradled her upper body in his arms while the doctor initially examined Zona, including the side of her head. However, when he went to examine the back of her neck, Shu sobbed in such great distress that the doctor abbreviated his examination out of respect for the man's grief. During her wake, friends and family noticed a couple of strange things. For one, friends found it odd that Shu never let anyone visit his wife's body without him present. For another, the way she was situated in the coffin. Shu had her head almost propped up or cradled by a folded up sheet on one side and another garment of some sort on the other. Why would that be necessary if she died of either heart failure or complications from pregnancy? Zona's mother, Mrs. Heaster, was like many people in that part of West Virginia at that time, without much money but rich in faith. Likely in a quest for comfort and to reconcile her grief, she prayed for help in understanding her daughter's sudden death. Her prayers were answered when her daughter visited her from beyond the grave. Both pedias state that it was in her mother's dreams that Zona paid her visits. The newspaper article, however, quotes Mrs. Heaster as stating, I had no dream, for I was as fully awake as I am at this moment. Also interesting to note is how her mother's testimony even made it into the trial. Not from the prosecution, but from the defense. But we'll get to all of that. Whether Mrs. Heaster was awake or dreaming, Zona detailed a life with an abusive husband who had killed her by breaking her neck. Allegedly, she demonstrated this by pulling a move straight out of The Exorcist. She pivoted her head around on her neck. Of course, this was decades before that movie would be released, so Mrs. Heaster had no frame of reference to make such a claim based on anything she'd seen through pop culture. At trial, here's what Mrs. Heaster told a jury that Zona had told her about her own murder. He came that night from the shop and seemed angry. I told him supper was ready, and he began to chide because I had prepared no meat for supper, and I replied that there was plenty. There was bread and butter, applesauce, preserves, and other things that made for a very good supper. 
and he flew mad and got up and came toward me when I raised up, and he seized each side of my head with his hands and by a sudden wrench dislocated my neck. With the conviction that her daughter had met with foul play at the hands of her son-in-law, Mrs. Heaster took her accusations to the authorities and demanded justice. Likely Zona's body wasn't exhumed just because Mrs. Heaster said her daughter's ghost had told her that she'd been murdered. The husband's strange behavior didn't help, nor did it help that people were talking. Against protest from Shu, a month after Zona's body had been buried, it was exhumed and a post-mortem examination was performed. It was decided her neck had been dislocated, which undoubtedly had caused her death. Of course, the testimony Mrs. Heaster had given at trial could have been coached by the prosecution, knowing what they did after the post-mortem exam. However, the fact remains that Mrs. Heaster was an upstanding, church-going, God-fearing member of the community who had just buried a daughter. She was grieving, sure, but she wasn't prone to flights of fantasy. It was possible in her sorrow that she had somehow forged a connection with her daughter in the great beyond. However, she did have some solid, albeit circumstantial, evidence in her possession also. You know that sheet that was propping up Zona's head in her coffin during the wake? Well, Mrs. Heaster asked her son-in-law about it, and he said, Mother, you keep it. However, it's a little confusing because it must not have been buried with Zona. At some point, she must have removed it, which seems strange because he was so concerned about Zona's head. But maybe he did it because they didn't want anything buried with her, they being her mom and other friends and family. That's the only thing that can explain this account in the newspaper article. When Mr. Shu was leaving from the burial for the house, she, Mrs. Heaster, called his attention to the sheet that had been under the side of her head in the coffin. So that must have been why he gave her the sheet. When, anyway, so she took the sheet home, but after three or four weeks, decided to wash it. Not because it looked dirty, but because she, quote, imagined it smelled badly. But when she washed it, the water turned red. And here's a part from the newspaper article, how she described it. When I pressed it down in the tub, it turned red, and I concluded I had spoiled my other clothes. But when I dipped up water in my hand, the water was not colored. I washed it and boiled it and hung it out and froze it three or four days, but it still had a reddish color. Someone who wasn't guilty of murdering his wife wouldn't protest against an exhumation of her body. Nor would he predict he'd be arrested when her body was examined. He definitely wouldn't say, they cannot prove I did it, even before said examination took place or any accusations about her cause of death were made. But Trout Shu did all of those things, and as he predicted, following the post-mortem examination, he was arrested and charged with murder, to which he pled not guilty. As it turned out, Shu was an unsavory character. He'd previously been in jail for stealing a horse, and his second wife also died under mysterious circumstances. His first one got off lucky. He abused her, but she was able to escape the fate of death by divorcing him. Zona was his third wife in what appeared to be his goal to be married seven times. However, his mother-in-law, with Zona's help, squashed those ambitions. Interestingly, Mrs. Heaster's story about her daughter's ghostly revelations was considered hearsay in the court's eyes and therefore was not admissible as evidence. 
However, the defense introduced it to the jury during their cross-examination of Zona's mom, probably in an effort to make her seem crazy. They're also the reason the stained sheet became an exhibit during the trial, which lasted eight days and then resulted in the jury finding Shu guilty of murdering his wife. They sentenced him to life, which ended up being pretty short. He died at the West Virginia Penitentiary in Moundsville. Accounts differ as to exactly when he died, though. The Encyclopedia of Ghosts and Spirits lists his death as March 13, 1900. A newspaper article from the Beckley Post Herald dated March 5, 1953, reported he died eight years after his sentencing. These days, on US 60 eastbound, at junction with I-64 just outside Sam Black Church in West Virginia, a historical marker titled Greenbrier Ghost commemorates the case with the following inscription. Interred in nearby cemetery is Zona Heaster Shoe. Her death in 1897 was presumed natural until her spirit appeared to her mother to describe how she was killed by her husband, Edward. Autopsy on the exhumed body verified the apparition's account. Edward, found guilty of murder, was sentenced to the state prison. Only known case in which testimony from ghost helped convict a murderer. Now let's turn to a case that fired up lots of people's imaginations after it aired on Unsolved Mysteries in 1990. After the Unsolved Mysteries episode, the Teresita Bassa case inspired the 1996 made-for-TV movie, Voice from the Grave. It was also a fact segment on the series Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction. However, Teresita's mystery was, as the Unsolved Mysteries fandom wiki put it, one of the few profiled that had been solved prior to the broadcast, which mainly focused on the supernatural aspects surrounding the murder. But it didn't start out either very supernatural or sensational. There was only a short mention of her murder on page 5 in the first section of the Chicago Tribune on Tuesday, February 22, 1977. The headline read, Woman Found Slain in Burning Flat. Not many details were released about Teresita Bassa at that time. All the public really knew was that she was a 48-year-old respiratory therapist who had worked at Chicago's Edgewater Hospital. She'd been stabbed to death and her body had been found under her bed. According to the 13th Battalion Chief, the apartment appeared to have been ransacked. The mattress and some clothing had been set on fire, likely in an attempt to cover up the murder but damage to the apartment overall had been minimal. Not much more was revealed about her when the Chicago Tribune announced six months later, on Saturday, August 13, 1977, that her killer had been caught. No supernatural connection was alluded to then either. It appeared good old-fashioned detective work and perseverance had cracked the case, as evidenced by the headline which read, Note leads to suspect in murder. Because even though the fire had done part of its job and destroyed any immediate evidence on or around Teresita's body, one clue had survived, a memo. The short note on it read, Get concert tickets for A period S period. Basically, the initials A.S. At least, that's what the August 13, 1977 Chicago Tribune reported. Other variations recounting the clue in this crime sometimes cite theater tickets instead of concert. But the initials always remain the same. A.S. Which wasn't a lot to go on. It might not have even been a clue at all. But it was something. Someone who knew Teresita. Someone who might have some information about who would want to kill her and why. 
So yeah, investigators couldn't help but wonder who those initials belonged to. Turns out they belonged to her killer, Alan Showery. Showery worked as a therapist technician at Edgewater Hospital. Teresita and Showery were not only co-workers but friends, or at least friendly. He was someone she knew well enough that she would have bought tickets for him. At first he admitted he had known Teresita, but not that he'd ever been in her apartment. Then his story changed, and he said he'd gone to fix her TV, but couldn't because he didn't have the right tools. Eventually he ended up confessing that he killed her. Jewelry was also identified by Teresita's relatives as belonging to her, which further incriminated him for reasons we'll get to in a bit. But basically overall, it sounds like a pretty open and shut case, right? Solved. So why was it featured 12 years later as a case on Unsolved Mysteries? Well, when Showery's attorney requested police reports in 1978, they became public record. This is when Teresita Bassa's murder not only became front page news, but when the public learned more about who she was. On Sunday, March 5, 1978, the Chicago Tribune ran a front page story titled, Did Voice from the Grave Name Killer? After Teresita graduated from Assumption College in Manila, she immigrated from the Philippines to the United States in the mid-1960s. She was a smart lady. In addition to her degree from Assumption, she also had a master's in music from Indiana University and had studied inhalation therapy in Chicago. But her studies didn't stop there. Even though she worked at Edgewater Hospital, she was also enrolled at Loyola University, where the paper reported she was preparing a doctor's thesis on music. She also taught music, piano lessons, from her home. The paper further stated her friends described her as a straight person, meaning she didn't drink. However, she wasn't a complete teetotaler. She had alcohol on hand for when friends who drank visited her. That shows she was thoughtful. The public also learned something about her that was actually none of anyone's business. However, because of the way she died, it became pertinent to the case. It had to do with her virginity. She hadn't lost it even though she was in her late 40s. Because she'd been found naked, Police first suspected she was the victim of a rape murder, but the medical examiner soon ruled out any sexual assault. Investigators Joseph Stahula and his partner, Lee Eplin, had tracked leads as far as they could. At the end of April 1977, they'd actually hit a roadblock. They were no closer to identifying anyone with the initials AS than they were when they first found the note with those initials on them in Teresita's apartment. And they certainly had no idea who her killer was. But then a curious thing happened. Evanston police reached out and asked Chicago police about a man named Alan Showery who worked at Edgewater Hospital, the same hospital Teresita had worked at. And notice the initials? Alan Showery, A.S. Well, that couldn't be coincidental. Naturally, they wondered, what gives? When Investigator Stahula contacted Evanston Police, they referred him to Dr. Jose Chua and his wife, Remebius, whose name I'm actually not sure I'm saying correctly, so I'm just going to call her Remy. The Chuas were reluctant to talk with the police, They had information about Teresita's death, but they were good people, law-abiding citizens. They didn't want any trouble or to be suspected of having anything to do with Teresita's death at all. Nor did they want people to think they were crazy, which who could blame them? They were questioning their own sanity at this point because they'd come across information about Teresita's death in a most unusual fashion. Like Teresita, the Chuas were also from the Philippines. 
Dr. Chua didn't know Teresita, but his wife, Remy, had worked as an inhalation specialist at Edgewater at the same time both Teresita and Alan Showery had worked there. In fact, Remy had met Teresita during orientation, but they worked different shifts and weren't close friends. Still, Remy must have made some kind of impact on Teresita because she reached out through Remy to identify her killer. Dr. Chua explained it all started one night when his wife suddenly went into the bedroom, laid down, and was staring blankly. He asked if she was okay, but the voice that responded wasn't hers. It also didn't speak in English. It replied in Tagalog, the language of the Philippine Islands. But there was also a hint of a strange Spanish accent. Was she having a stroke or something? He immediately went to check her more closely and asked her to state her name. He didn't expect or hope for anything other than the answer to be Remy Chua. Instead, the voice said she was Teresita Bassa and a man named Alan Showery had killed her. He explained to the investigators that Teresita told him how Showery had arrived at her apartment around 7 p.m. and then had stabbed her. About 30 minutes later, Teresita released her hold on Remy. Other than being thirsty, Dr. Chua's wife had no knowledge of the conversation that had transpired between him and Teresita. They decided not to tell anyone about it because they were afraid to look foolish. That wasn't going to work for Teresita, though. She was determined to see her killer caught, so she once again spoke through Remy and begged Dr. Chua to help. Being an educated, rational man, Dr. Chua explained police would need something tangible besides this crazy story of Teresita possessing his wife. Teresita knew just the ammo he needed. She explained Showery had stolen jewelry from her, something police hadn't been aware of. He'd given some to his wife and the rest to his girlfriend. Teresita also explained how the jewelry could be identified. But even after this second visit, Dr. Chua and his wife were reluctant to go to the police, so they didn't. However, after a third visit from Teresita, they did. Even though Remy didn't seem aware of what was happening, it was unnerving for the Chuas to experience something like this, as you might imagine. If they told police, though, maybe it would finally stop. Bingo! Police listened, especially investigator Stahula. His partner and him paid Showery a visit. At the time of the murder, Showery had lived elsewhere, but had since moved and was then living with a woman who was wearing a pearl cocktail ring, much like the one Teresita had described to Dr. Chua to tell police about. When questioned, Showery's girlfriend explained he'd given it to her at the end of February as a late Christmas gift. She also had a jade pendant Showery had given her, which Teresita's relatives identified as belonging to her. Apparently realizing the gig was up, Showery confessed. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison and was released after serving his time. So those are two cases where ghosts help solve their own murders, but there's one more that even predates both of these by a couple hundred years, actually. It recently came to my attention by way of William Uchtman, who shared it when he left a comment on a post about the new shock docs, The Curse of Lizzie Borden. He left a link to an entry on NewEnglandHistoricalSociety.com titled The 1673 Murder of Rebecca Cornell and the Good Fire. It was about a case in 1673 where Thomas Cornell found his mother, Rebecca, badly burned on the floor of the sitting room. At first, he didn't think it was his mother for some reason, though. He believed it was a drunk Native American, 
At first, it was determined Rebecca had died because of the fire. It was assumed she fell asleep and ash from her pipe had fallen on her clothes, igniting them. However, the case was given a second look when her brother John said his dead sister had paid him a visit. Here's John's testimony that the New England Historical Society shared in their post. He felt something heave up the bedclothes twice and thought somebody had been coming to bed to him, whereupon he awaked and turned himself about in his bed, and being turned, he perceived a light in the room, like to the dawning of the day, and plainly saw the shape and appearance of a woman standing by his bedside, whereat he much was affrighted and cried out, In the name of God, what art thou? The apparition answered, I am your sister, Cornell, and twice said, See how I was burnt with fire? She didn't specifically name her killer, but her brother interpreted her visit that she hadn't died because of the fire. Someone had purposely burned her body, perhaps to cover up evidence like Alan Showery did in the Teresita Bassa case? Perhaps. Still, a second look was taken, and upon this examination, it was determined Rebecca had a wound to her stomach that had likely killed her. How they missed that the first time, I'm not sure, but I'm thinking examinations weren't as thorough as they are now. At any rate, the conclusion was made that her son, Thomas, had killed her, and he was charged with her murder. Many people were aware Rebecca complained about Thomas and his wife not treating her very well and that she was planning on moving to the home of another son come spring. One of her complaints was that he didn't maintain enough firewood or heat his home enough and that he didn't even warm her bed at night. Back in the day, you know, that was a thing. You'd put embers in what always reminds me of a kind of a old-fashioned popcorn maker, sort of a covered skillet on a stick. Anyway, you'd put that warming pan in the bed to warm your sheets. Uh, There was some conjecture that setting her on fire after he killed her was his way of saying, there, Mom, how's that for fire? Warm enough for you now? The jury did end up convicting Thomas of murder, but they didn't really have any concrete evidence that he had done it. He ended up dying on the gallows, though. But here's how the New England Historical Society ended their post about the story. However, the case of Rebecca Cornell caused the people of Rhode Island to debate whether spectral evidence should be used in criminal cases at all. It hasn't happened very often, but as we've seen in this episode, spectral evidence has played a part in solving at least a few real-life murders. Whether it should be used for solving crimes or not, well, there is always the danger of someone abusing spectral evidence, meaning that for whatever reason, vindictiveness, anger, jealousy, what have you, they might say a ghost visited them and name a certain person as the killer who really isn't. But these days, it's unlikely you could get away with such an accusation without physical proof to back it up, as like what happened in Teresa DeBoss's case. Of course, they could go to the trouble of planting evidence, but that seems like it would take a lot of planning and effort to pull off. But it might make for a good book or movie plot. Speaking of, if you have a favorite book or movie with the plotline of a ghost helping to solve their own murder, I'd love to hear about it. Or, I guess, rather, read about it. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast provider, you can send an email to podcast at hauntjaunts.net. And if you're listening on YouTube, feel free to leave a comment. Thank you so much for joining me for this second episode of our Haunting American True Crime series here on the Haunt Johns podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe, especially if you don't want to miss the next episode. 
which will stick with a bit of a ghostly ghostly theme, sort of, will look at cases involving spiritualism and gypsy curses. Until then, ciao for now.